And our next speaker is Dr. Tommy John Jameson. So we're welcome. Uh, we're, we're grateful to have Tommy here today. Tommy is a military historian and assistant professor of strategic studies in the defense analysis department at the Naval Postgraduate School. That's my old alma mater. So I'm, I'm proud to have him here too. Uh, his work explores the history of naval development and conflict in the Pacific with an emphasis on technological shifts and institutional ad adaptation. He holds a PhD and a master's in international history from Harvard, a BA in history from Grinnell College, as well as language certificates from the Beijing Language and Culture University. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone and the platform over to Dr. Tommy Jamison. Tommy, it's great to have you here, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Wampi. Uh, the delight is all mine. I'm grateful for the opportunity um, and very happy to be here. Um, I suppose it should be mentioned as well that I served with some very dubious uh, distinction as a junior naval intelligence officer in the Western Pacific as my first job out of uh, high school, which in some ways inspired me to be interested in uh, chi the Chinese military and Chinese military modernization uh, in the long durée. And that is what is essentially the topic of our discussion today. I want to think about that other major continental power on the Pacific that is engaged uh, in uh, competition in the maritime uh, frontier, the maritime zone, and to think about it in a long-term historical perspective. Some of this will no doubt be remedial or review for uh, members of an audience as sophisticated as this one that may have uh, some experience in studying Chinese uh, history. Uh, but I hope that by probing the history of the late Qing, exploring the history of the late Qing through the lens of great power operations, great gray war operations, gray zone operations, and uh, great power competition, that I might provide some provocations uh, that will be useful uh, to the audience and to uh, the conference. So uh, by way of review, the Qing came to power uh, in the 17th century uh, in the Manchu conquest of the Ming dynasty in 1644. Uh, and they're essentially the most successful continental empire of the 18th century. Emperors like Kangxi and uh, Qianlong uh, expand the boundaries of continental China deep into uh, Central Asia, uh, conquering parts of what is today Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang, and the like. Uh, it's really some of the most incredible feats of administrative and military statecraft of any age. But the Qing, uh, as a dynasty, are are more familiar to us, certainly for audiences looking out from California or Hawaii, uh, for their 19th century troubles. This is the dynasty that, despite the prodigious and really creative efforts of a number of military reformers in the late 19th century, uh, suffered through uh, what is commonly called the century of national humiliation, the Opium Wars, the Taiping uh, Civil War, the Boxer Rebellion, and so forth. The Qing finally collapse in 1911, and China descends into a period of, of uh, warlordism, semi-colonialism, and factionalism, out of which the Chinese Communist Party emerges uh, as the dominant political factor in the 1940s. Now, th that's more or less the tale that's told by these two images, which I often use to uh, start a course courses on uh, modern Chinese uh, military history the fall into semi-colonialism beset by avaricious empires around the periphery of China, uh, only to be redeemed by the Chinese Communist Party in 1949. And viewed through this sort of, uh, this cartoonish perspective, uh, it's easy to see why the late 19th century Chinese modernizers have fared uh, so poorly, why they're such a maligned bunch uh, in the contemporary literature. Uh, at least until recently, uh, as they've been uh, reevaluated by a number of contemporary historians. Warfare is a results-based business. I probably don't need to tell uh, members of this audience. And it's easy to appreciate why Qing leaders uh, would, would come out the, the wrong end of the historical uh, treatment because of their performance in conflict. Uh, defeat in the Opium Wars, one and two, defeat in the Sino-French War, defeat in the Sino-Japanese War, uh, and defeat in the Boxer War, Boxer Rebellion, alongside many other sundry indignities. But of course, history, uh, history tends to be more complicated than propaganda posters. Uh, by other metrics, metrics that were more significant to the Chinese themselves, the Qing uh, should be seen as one of the most successful empires of the early modern period. 
the reigns of Kangxi to Qianlong, basically the entire 18th century, is commonly known as the glorious century or the glorious time, the Shengshi in China, uh, sort of a deliberate contrast, I think, to the century of natural humiliation which follows. There are many Qing historians like Mark Elliott and Peter Perdue who take all this very seriously and have done great work documenting the success of the Qing as a continental power in the 18th century. Uh, really, a really remarkable success that make the frontiers of China and Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet uh, today. I want to acknowledge all that and sort of to stipulate that the Qing is a very successful continental power, uh, but then to, to shift our perspective, to move away from that story and focus on the 19th century and the maritime uh, frontier. And, and this is a really sort of sharp contrast from the glorious century to the century of national humiliation try as they might, uh, creative, intelligent reformers from the opium era, uh, Commissar Lin Zizhu to Li Hongzhang, uh, couldn't protect uh, the coasts and river ports of China from the predations of European and later Japanese uh, gunboats. There's a historian at the London School of Economics named Ronald Poe who's done some really interesting work on the Qing uh, maritime frontier in the 18th century. But I think in the 19th century, the one that we're more familiar with, the narrative is it remains one of failure. My intention today is to think about the Qing, uh, and in particular the 19th century maritime frontier, uh, without the weight of teleology upon it. Uh, what does that mean? Well, well that, that means to not necessarily read back from failures in particular conflicts, but rather to consider the world that Qing officials confronted uh, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. One of great power competition, one of gray zone operations, and one full of really profound possibilities and contingencies. In particular, uh, I want to talk today about the Qing military from the 1860s on uh, through the lens of great power competition and gray zone operations. Emerging out of the backdrop of the Taiping Civil War, uh, Chinese officers in the Qing bureaucracy sponsored two ambitious and really deeply related uh, military modernization efforts, the Tongzhi Restoration and the Foreign Affairs Movement. The division I'm uh, imposing on the two of them is, is a little crude, but I think it's useful. Uh, the first period is the Tongzhi Restoration, uh, running through the 18, sort of the late 1870s, and the second, the Foreign Affairs Movement, which takes us through the late 1890s. Conveniently for us, there are two real concrete tests of the Qing modernization programs: the Sino-French War uh, in the early 1880s, and then the Sino-Japanese War in the 1890s, which provide uh, sort of an, a, a chance to put all this uh, rubber to the road and see how far the Qing had indeed actually come. Finally, uh, I want to think about these events as a form of applied history, uh, as a form of soft power, and talk about how the historical understanding of the late Qing is shaping uh, Chinese military modernization uh, today. Now, as I've said a couple of times, uh, the conventional understanding of these conflicts is uh, one of failure. Uh, and that's true to an extent, I'll acknowledge, in terms of battlefield results. But take it on its own terms, the Qing modernization uh, effort is also just a startling success uh, in terms of gray hulls, uh, that is conventional naval forces that are acquired or built in the late 19th century uh, by Qing functionaries. Uh, the Chinese Navy really astonished the world and catapulted its way up international rankings of naval power. Uh, and given that today the PLAN has never been tested in, in conflict, I think this achievement from the 1880s and 90s is of a comparable uh, measure to the waves that have been made by the People's Liberation Army Navy today. Moreover, as a matter of gray zone operations, of regular uh, resistance, of innovation through asymmetric technologies uh, and low conflict across the uh, spectrum, uh, operations, there is likewise much to redeem uh, the Qing and mainland historians working in China uh, have worked fairly assiduously in recent years to do that. And I want to summarize some of the findings uh, of those uh, scholars. Okay, let's let's begin uh, with the Tongzhi restoration, or at least sort of proximately to it with the opium era official Lin Zixu. Um, oh, excuse me, the opium era reformer uh, Wei Yuan. Uh, Wei Yuan is uh, one of the more significant uh, scholar officials uh, of the late Qing. Uh, and though he sits outside the strict temple boundaries of the Tongzhi Restoration, he sets the table really nicely for us today. 
Uh, for many years, the conventional understanding of Chinese history in the United States was that the Opium Wars provided a shock that sort of roused China out of a stupor and encouraged a spate of modernization efforts. And this has been complicated uh, over the years. Uh, many here will know this as the impact response theory of Chinese history. Um, but it's absolutely true that Wei Yuan and his contemporaries in the 1840s made really important intellectual contributions to the idea of the maritime frontier uh, and how to defend it. Indeed, in 2012, a PRC historian at a conference, maybe not so dissimilar to this one, uh, made the case that uh, Wei Yuan anticipated the ideas of sea power uh, first articulated by Alfred Thayer Mahan by almost 50 uh, years, uh, half a century. Uh, that's a debate for another time, I suppose. But uh, Wei Yuan's magnum opus, seen here, the Illustrated Treatise of the Maritime Kingdoms, uh, does provide some early thinkings about how China might go about defending uh, its coastline from the predations of European imperialists, how it would enter into this early phase of great power competition in the maritime Pacific. The strategy advanced by Wei Yuan is that of studying the foreigners uh, to advance technologies and controlling them through them, to study the ways of the foreigners uh, and by means of them to control the foreigners, uh, which itself is sort of a modification of a longstanding Chinese strategic uh, emphasis on using barbarians to control uh, barbarians. Uh, this is fundamentally a strategy of maritime defense by a continental power. Uh, and we can see similar attempts to that articulated by Wei Yuan and the writings of Lin Zixu and Yao Ying, who are contemporaries of Wei Yuan. The core emphasis here is, is fairly straightforward. It's on the construction of what are called strong ships and powerful cannon to com compete more or less symmetrically with European forces, Chuanjie and Pao Li. The debate is actually quite a dynamic one uh, as thinkers try to balance point defense versus coastal defense, all amidst uh, this climate of really accelerating technological change in the industrial era, what technologies to buy, what technologies to overlook and so forth. Now, Wei Yuan is onto something, and he gets quite a bit of traction in the Qing bureaucracy, but he's overcome by events. Um, the Qing suffers uh, the Taiping Civil War beginning in the 1850s, which is in many ways the most, uh, in many respects, the most destructive civil war uh, in all of modern history. Um, and it required this conflict, this internal conflict, required less to put down, um, less in terms of advanced weaponry uh, and sophistication to put down than it did effective leadership. Uh, and the administrative raising of local militias. So naval defense sort of fell by the side. Uh, it became less important than did control of internal uh, stability within China. The order uh, created out of the Taiping Civil War is known as the Tongzhi uh, Restoration, or the period of, of joint rule. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion War is a, a war of national consolidation for the Qing. Uh, and after it, we have sort of a new effort of nationalization, uh, of consolidation, uh, from which uh, the Qing can continue its efforts uh, exploring uh, advanced naval technologies as a means of resisting uh, European predations. Uh, the Tongzhi restora uh, Restoration is a shorthand for a great number of things, but among them is uh, a modernization effort in the 1860s and 70s that responds to the security crises of the moment, which is a fresh round of attacks by European forces. <clears throat> That's highlighted, uh, I think, uh, mostly by the Second Opium War between 1856 and the 1860s. And this picture is one I snapped uh, from the Dogu forts outside of Tianjin, uh, a fort that was forced open uh, by uh, British and French forces during the Second Opium uh, War. And it sort of demonstrates that whatever the tremendous uh, threat of internal rebellion was to dynastic sur uh, survival, uh, in the Qing, the sea remained an untamed frontier from which threats could approach the capital. And you can understand why if you go through uh, the museum uh, today and you confront images like this one of James Hope uh, Grant. Uh, it's a, a placard that describes his imperial resume, the crowning achievement of which is his participation in the burning of the Summer Palace just outside of Beijing, which remains one of the seminal moments in the national humiliation of uh, China to this day. With men like this operating along the littorals and the Taiping defeated, the Tongzhi Restoration made a fresh push for maritime and industrial uh, development. In the 1860s, we see arsenals popping up along the coast of China uh, at Jiangnan, at Fuzhou, at Tianjin, and other places. 
the Jiangyan Arsenal was really one of the most remarkable achievements of modern Chinese history, and it caught the attention of many visiting officer, officers, among them uh, a U.S. naval officer in 1871 who surveyed uh, the arsenal just outside of Nanking and, quote, commenting favorably on its achievements. Uh, already there existed their uh, weapons, uh, for, uh, machines for the production of industrial weapons, uh, including torpedoes and rifled artillery. This is a really sort of profound shift in a relatively short amount of time. Moreover, Qing officials began to circulate overseas, acquiring knowledge uh, and expertise in advanced weapon systems. One stopped in Boston Harbor in 1867 and looked out over a fleet of decommissioned U.S. Civil War era monitors and found in it a recipe for Qing success. Surely, if a continental power like the United States can invest in such a vast fleet, then perhaps to uh, could the Qing. I think most substantially uh, down in Fuzhou in southern China, uh, the hero of the Taiping Civil War, Zhou Zongtang, constructed China's first industrial naval dockyard, supported by French advisors, which began producing steamships, the avatar of industrialization in the 1870s. The most impressive of the bunch is, is this one. I'm, I'm sorry about the cruddy photograph, but you can blame the technology of the 19th century. Um, and it, it reckons um, among the more capable warships in the Western Pacific. Um, I'm unusually impressed by the speed of these arsenals and their output, and I'm not alone. Uh, in the 1870s, a USN officer who toured this arsenal that produced this warship um, found five steamships, quote, well-armed and of superior build, with one, the Yangwu, seen here, being larger and uh, the remainder a trifle smaller than the Kearsarge, in quote, which was, the Kearsarge was the uh, primary uh, combatant available to US naval forces at the time in the Western Pacific. So already we have a sense of catching up with, uh, the, with certainly with the United States forces and a parity uh, in, in the output of industrial weapons, which I think is a story not so much of failure, but rather of success given the constraints put upon uh, the chain. Now, much of this is stimulated by the threat of European uh, imperial aggression, uh, but there's a sea change in 1874 uh, and that comes about because of the uh, Japanese invasion and brief occupation of portions of Taiwan, then known as Formosa, uh, in response to the murder of several shipwrecked Japanese sailors. Uh, typically, historians have attributed uh, Chinese investment in naval forces to the threat of European gunboats, but recently, uh, we see a recognition of this event as a really sort of key pivot. Uh, already a key uh, moment in the fault line developing in the geopolitics of the Western Pacific and of the security dilemma between China and Japan. It's one thing to be invaded by European gunboats, but it's quite another thing to be occupied by uh, what was at that time still seen as a tributary state of the Qing Empire. And here we see uh, forces uh, from this expedition, Japanese forces from that uh, expedition, hamming it up with uh, indigenous Taiwanese looking for all the world like members of the European Imperialist Club. Now, the, the long-term upshot of this is naval tension uh, over the first island chain that uh, comes down to us to this very day. Uh, but more approximately, Japanese aggression against places like Taiwan and Okinawa um, spurred China on to new uh, levels of naval investment. Or as the US uh, junior officer, naval officer, H.E. Mullen noted in 1882, uh, the occupation of Formosa had, quote, clearly spurred China on in the field of competitions. So we have this, this spirit of great power competition coming out of the period uh, quite aggressively. All this to say that by the early 1880s, uh, things are, are, are getting quite serious in terms of Chinese naval modernization. We find officials like this gentleman, uh, uh, Lin Taizong, uh, enrolling in foreign uh, naval academies. He'll actually spend a good deal of time cruising with the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic. Uh, embassies abroad produce contracts for cruising warships uh, with German and British firms uh, and, uh, and, uh, and acquire a, a great number of them. And these are sort of the gray halls to which my uh, title uh, refers to in this presentation, an attempt at symmetrical competition with foreign navies driven primarily through uh, the purchase or, or construction of uh, proven military technologies like industrial steam warships. Uh, but there's always a but. Um, beyond warships, beyond symmetrical competition, great power competition, uh, the reformers were some tactically and intellectually really curious people, and they, they, they saw in the rapid pace of 
industrial technological change and opportunity as much as they did uh, challenge. And I think that's particularly true in terms of asymmetric technologies like the automobile torpedo or, or fish torpedo as it is uh, directly uh, translated in Chinese. But we have some evidence that in the form of this document, which is a contract in 1882 between Li Hongzhang uh, and the senior US Naval officer in theater, uh, Commodore Schufelt, loaning out a US junior officer, a Marine to serve as an advisor uh, in the Chinese Navy. Li's interest in the torpedo is a really long running one and it sort of goes parallel uh, to his efforts to acquire seagoing warships. Uh, this interest in asymmetric technologies is quite, is quite deep. In 1874, he uh, sponsors the publication of a Chinese language version of a tract on torpedo defenses that's originally written during the Civil War. In 1877, he sponsors some of the first tests of a torpedo outside of Tianjin uh, that was produced by an American officer designed by an American engineer named John Lay. Uh, and then that, that brings us to the 1880s. By 1882, things had gotten so serious that uh, China had founded a torpedo school and here as acquiring a US Marine Corps officer to serve as the chief instructor uh, therein. Uh, this document today is housed in the Library of Congress in, in Washington, DC, and it's one of my favorite. Um, it's a, it, Lee is interested in the torpedo and in particular a US torpedo officer, he stresses in this, um, not only because of the weapons revolutionary technology, but also because the United States and China share many of the same geographical features, making an American perspective particularly uh, valuable to them. Both possess long coastlines uh, and far reaching rivering networks that could be penetrated by foreign ships uh, and making the torpedo especially relevant to both. All this to say that there's just a lot of stuff happening as of 1880s and it's a moment of really tremendous potential. Uh, albeit protean potential. Well, that's obvious enough to the leading uh, naval diplomat of his era, era Commodore Robert Schufelt, uh, the author of this uh, contract. In 1880, Schufelt argued to Li Hongzhong that under proper management, quote, China should dominate the waters which wash its shores and exercise a commercial influence upon the Pacific Rim. It may be taken for granted that with a proper system of coast defense, both uh, naval and military, no Western power could attack China from the sea with any prospect of permanent success. Shufat actually goes on to offer uh, to serve in the Chinese Navy as an admiral, admiral though, the Chinese demur. I dwell on all of this because in the 1880s, to US observers, um, people are, are, are quite bullish, US observers at least, are quite bullish about the capabilities of the Chinese uh, navies, uh, Navy. Most often we see these events, uh, these modernization efforts in retrospect, searching out the origins of defeat in this or that war. But at the time, contemporaries uh, were optimistic about the capabilities of this new great power in the Western Pacific. Now this brings us to the Sino-French uh, War, uh, which we should sort of see as a concrete test of the Tongzhou restoration and this early modernization effort. Uh, it comes about in between 1833 and 1885 uh, and it's precipitated by French expansion in Southeast Asia and the Qing efforts uh, to check it, check it as it approaches Southern uh, China. The headline of this conflict, if you pick up any standard textbook on China, is that things go really badly for the Qing. Um, most famously, the destruction of the Chinese warships at the Battle of Fuzhou in 1884. We have uh, oil painting uh, of this by a French artist. Now, this event was indeed an un unmitigated disaster for the Qing, uh, the entire Fujian dockyard is destroyed in more or less an afternoon after a decade of construction efforts. Uh, eight French ships destroy nine of 11 Chinese vessels and kill approximately 3,000 uh, Chinese soldiers, uh, Chinese sailors as well, I suppose, uh, including among the ships, uh, the Yangwu, which we discussed earlier in this presentation. This though, I don't think is the whole story of the Sino-French War, and it's perhaps not even the most important bit as we look back from the 21st century. The ships and shipyards may have failed in Southern China, but there are many examples of asymmetric and irregular war uh, that are far more nuanced in their operation uh, than paintings and perceptions like this would, success, would suggest. The PRC historians writing in the 1950s and 60s would say that while advanced technologies failed to check the French, there are a lot of example of, examples of successful people's war in this period. And I wanna make a variation of that argument 
and say that while uh, advanced fleets may have failed in symmetrical competition, we see a lot of examples of irregular warfare uh, that have lessons for subsequent chain reformers and perhaps even echo down to the present. The first of these is the defense of uh, Taiwan. Um, there are two major engagements uh, in the French campaign against Taiwan. The first is against Geelong, which is a, a port city in Taiwan uh, and one of the Qing's first and largest coal mines in this period. Uh, it's taken by the French eventually after heavy, after sustaining heavy casualties, uh, but not before the Qing commander in charge of the garrison managed to flood the coal mines, thereby uh, obviating their potential use uh, to the uh, French as a practical base. And because access to coal, command over coal, control of it, was really seen as an index of power in the modern world, certainly to the Chinese themselves, this was a symbolic figure, victory of considerable magnitude. Still more impressive, um, uh, we see uh, forces under Sun Kai Hua, who decisively repulse uh, a French landing at Danshui, Taiwan, through asymmetric means. Earlier that summer, Chinese forces uh, emplaced torpedo mines in the port in the hopes that uh, French, would, French forces would stay away. Uh, and it was a measured success. Attempts at landing were frustrated not only by uh, artillery barrages, shore-based artillery, uh, and disciplined infantry tactics, but also because of maritime obstructions that are loosed into the harbor that impede the French uh, movements. Now, this is uh, buried pretty deep in the historical literature on the war, but at the time, uh, it, it was quite significant uh, and interpreted as an omen for French regional influence in the future. British War Office intelligence, from which uh, this uh, image is, is taken, uh, observed, quote, that there can be no question that the French have received a severe check, and perhaps it would be, quote, a tide in the turn, a turn in the tide of the war. We see really ec ecstatic uh, coverage of the event in the vernacular Chinese press, uh, and uh, reports in the New York Times, the North China, China Herald, uh, Anglophone publications are all uh, extremely interested in this event as a potential uh, inflection point in the war against the French. And by contrast, in France, uh, news of the event is censored from the public because it, would, it was deemed uh, too dangerous to popular morale. This is clearly a case for celebration. I think it's matched and even exceeded by the defense of Zhenghai uh, by the uh, Qing functionary Shui Fucheng, who manages to stuff up uh, the river estuary uh, of the Yangtze and protect the city of Ningbo from uh, attacking French forces uh, using uh, both coastal artillery and also uh, improvised uh, torpedo mines and obstructions, sort of the similar plane flook to that used to defend Taiwan from French amphibious forces. All this to say the Marxist interpretation of these events is that popular will is what drives off the French. And that's, that's perhaps true to a point, but we see a lot of advanced industrial weapons used in this effort. Uh, and we should also, I think, interpret it as an early example of a regular maritime war and the limits of French imperialism, perhaps even an early attempt at something like area access, uh, anti-access area denial uh, underway in the Qing Empire. Now, uh, this brings us to the, our next phase of naval modernization, the creation of the Bayong Navy in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, defeat in the French, time of the French war, does little to discourage the Qing. In fact, it sort of encourages them to double down on naval expansion, which is the, the subject of our next section. The Bayang Navy is formed in the aftermath of the Sino-French War, and it would quickly become, on paper at least, the dominant regional force in East Asia. This is clear to officials in the Meiji government as well, uh, and uh, the acquisition of advanced combatants by the Qing government sparks uh, a new phase in the naval race uh, for primacy between uh, the Meiji and Qing empires. That's at least ex as exciting as that on underway uh, contemporaneously between the French and Great Britain or Germany and Great Britain. Once, away, once again, contracts go out for cruisers like this one in Newcastle, uh, but also uh, battleships and a new innovation, the torpedo boat, and a key tool of asymmetric warfare uh, and coastal defense. Uh, ships like this one outfitted in Newcastle by the Armstrong Corporation are some of the finest produced uh, in the decade, and they form sort of the bread and butter of the Chinese Beiyang fleet, or Northern fleet. There are also improvements uh, in shore defenses, taking on board lessons from defeat. Uh, the uh, extension of, of telegraph lines provide for better C2, acquisition of advanced rifled guns and the like. 
a more competent set of foreign advisors are uh, acquired as well, or hired as it were. Uh, this gentleman is uh, Philo Norton McGiffin. He's a US Naval Academy graduate who will serve 10 years in China and eventually be wounded um, at the Battle of the Yalu. And he'll serve uh, with distinction as the, the founding head of the Chinese Naval Academy in Wei Hai Wei. Most significantly, this period sees the entrance of uh, the Qing Navy into the race for real navalist power through the acquisition of two ocean-going armor-clad warships, the Dingyuan and the Zhenyuan. Uh, the Dingyuan is seen here on the left, uh, and it is really one of the more powerful warships of its age in terms of armament and weight displacement. Indeed, more powerful than the main, of remember the main fame uh, seen uh, at right. Visiting Japanese ports in 1891, these vessels made clear who the principal power, regional power in East Asia was, and sort of a soft power demonstration of Qing, um, Qing primacy. Unfortunately for the Qing, sort of unluckily for the Qing, as was the case in the Sino-French War, uh, conflicts aren't fought through intelligence assessments and war reports. Uh, however, bullish uh, perceptions were of Qing power uh, in the late 18, in the early 1890s. Uh, another concrete test loomed, and in this case, it's the Sino-Japanese War. Now, the Sino-Japanese War is fought ostensibly over the conflict of the Korean Peninsula, but it really grows out of this long-standing tension, security dilemma between uh, the Japanese Empire and the Qing Empire that endures to this day. The most famous and enduring milestone of the war is the Battle of the Yalu in September of 1894 off the coast of Korea uh, that most observers instantly recognized as the Trafalgar of its age. And for an era uh, deeply invested in navalist theories about battleships and naval primacy, uh, Japan, Japan's decisive victory in that engagement cast a really long shadow. But as significantly, uh, the Sino, uh, just as in the case of the Sino-French War, there's a great deal going on besides. In addition to the gray-hauled ships, we find tools of great war, uh, of lawfare, of information, and asymmetrical warfare that I want to deal with in uh, succession as we examine uh, this conflict. Let's begin with uh, this, the Kaohsiung Hao incident, or the Kaohsiung Hao incident uh, as an early form. Well, I'd like to examine this as an early form of lawfare practiced by the Qing state. As Japanese forces began to move into Korea, the Qing uh, hired European transports, British transports, to move troops across the Bohai Gulf to the Korean Peninsula, which was a dangerous thing to do given that they lacked uh, control of the sea. Uh, escorted by a cruiser and a gunboat, the British-operated troop ship, British-owned troop ship, uh, Kaohsiung, found itself amid the Japanese flying squadron on July 25th, 1894, uh, and it was uh, sunk uh, by the Japanese cruiser Naniwa, uh, which did not bother to evacuate the Chinese crew from the vessel. Uh, the result uh, is that not only was the ship sunk, but approximately a thousand Qing uh, soldiers lost their lives through drowning, uh, while some 300 managed to be rescued by swimming to shore uh, or uh, throwing themselves on the mercy of uh, a European warships in the area. All this uh, before the war had even started, right? Uh, before overt hostilities had been declared, uh, and thus uh, a, a major diplomatic row ensues. Uh, it's a legal crisis of some considerable magnitude. It's also an information crisis of some magnitude that's fought in the press. We see examples of this in this French uh, cartoon uh, on the left. Um, I, I think even more than the matter of perceptions are some of the nebulous and really nettlesome questions of international law that this incident provoked. Uh, while the Japanese cruiser was an aggressor in the case and had attacked a foreign warship uh, outside of uh, openly declared hostilities, uh, whatever basic protections the Qing Empire could have hoped to have received uh, basically evaporate out of the name in the name of political expediency. Britain, the owner of the ship, uh, looking for a reliable maritime ally in the Western Pacific, chose to side with Japan, uh, complaining that the Chinese had mutinied on board the ship and therefore were not uh, uh, protected uh, by legal constraints. The controversy uh, stretches on for almost a decade, but the upshot of it is that the Qing government eventually pays an indemnity uh, to the British for the loss of the ship, which I find to be sort of incredible, uh, given that a thousand Chinese soldiers lost their lives in the event. <clears throat> 
this is a failure, right? This is another failure of, of the application of, of lawfare to shape the battlefield, to shape the, uh, the circumstances of, the mil of military engagement, but it's an early attempt to mobilize international courts uh, towards uh, China's advantage. And I think we can see echoes of that down to today. It's an early precedent and a tradition uh, that is very much uh, with us in the present. It's also worth noting that the Naniwa skipper, uh, the man in charge uh, of the warship during uh, this en engagement, so-called, uh, goes on to win considerable fame uh, as the as the admiral of the Japanese fleet during the Russo-Japanese War, and he's sometimes described as the Nelson of Asia. So, uh, as noted, the the headline of this war is the Battle of the Yalu, um, and uh, there is considerable articles and books about it at the time uh, as European forces consider its implications uh, for navalism and great power competition. Um, but for our purposes, I think uh, the battle is also in and the operations surrounding it are equally interesting because of the really rich information environment uh, that are playing out around it almost in real time. There are 114 reporters that embed with the Japanese uh, army during the war, uh, representing 66 news organization uh, and including 11 illustrators and six photographers, all who provide sort of a new visual sense of the war. Uh, there's, there's this funny sort of word in, in Chinese strategic publications these days of informationized conditions. And I think we're seeing exactly that, a war that's fought with near real-time reporting uh, and near real-time visual representations for popular audiences. Um, indeed, uh, some of the finest Japanese manga and print culture comes out of uh, this war, and it communicates the stakes of the conflict, and, you know, really tries to evoke a sense of, of glamour about it. I, I like to think of it almost as if uh, today uh, a TikTok was being run simultaneously uh, with a confrontation. But uh, unlikely for the Japanese or, or complicated in Japanese effort to shape uh, perceptions of the battle, there are foreign correspondents who embed with the second Japanese army that's advancing across uh, mainland Asia at this time. Uh, this comes to grief in reportage surrounding the sack of Port Arthur or the uh, Battle of Lushin. Um, Japanese artists would have you believe that this was uh, something glorious and, and civilized, uh, but what the foreign media picks up on, what particularly the Anglophone media picks up on, is a, a story of, of, of massacre, uh, of, of rapine. Um, real crimes that are committed by the Japanese troops storming the city, notably the, the murder of surrendered uh, Qing uh, troops, are exaggerated, uh, and they really take on new meanings uh, in the court of international opinion. I think we can sort of see this as an early uh, uh, sort of really presaging uh, many of the controversies that will come out of the rape of Nanking in 1937. See, this sort of an early example of this. William Sims, uh, a US Naval officer in theater who will go on to be uh, perhaps the most significant member of the US Naval bureaucracy, apart from Alfred Thayer Mahan in the, in the early 20th century, uh, scoffed in a letter to his parents that J the Japanese, quote, seem to have forgotten what they have read in European military books and return to their customary manner of making war. There's a US mercenary serving with the Qing uh, who reported, uh, quote, a diabolical order of murder and mutilation in the Japanese taking of Port Arthur. It's all a great deal of melodramatic detail and it all shapes perceptions of the Japanese army uh, and its activities in this war. The stakes of this are pretty uh, significant because a key outcome of the war uh, is the re-evaluation of where Japan stands among the great powers of the international system. And it's, it's, it's also significant, I think, uh, in that Japan's claim to hold Port Arthur as a spoil of the conflict after 1895 as a trophy, a victory trophy, uh, is challenged and eventually thwarted by Germany, France, and Russia. And it's very difficult for, I think, us today to disentangle how perceptions of the sacking of Port Arthur and the refusal of the European great powers to accede to the Japanese occupation of the port might have interacted. I see these as sort of integral uh, and a case where perhaps the information environment really shaped the outcome of the war, which really shaped the war termination. Uh, finally, and with the long shadow of the Battle of the Yalu, this sort of decisive uh, apogee of naval uh, confrontation between battleship battleships, it's worth knowing that Japanese victory was finally achieved not through a decisive sea engagement, but through infiltration and night assaults with uh, torpedo boats at the Weihai Wei 
harbor uh, in northern uh, China. And here we have a, a great illustration of just that, uh, the Japanese torpedo boat number, se number nine celebrating the torpedoing of uh, the Chinese ironclad Ding Yuan. So there, I, this is a, a war, uh, a, a navalist battle, a conventional war between great powers. But already we see many of the key theaters of gray zone operations. There's lawfare, there's the information environment, and there's asymmetric tactics. Finally, uh, I wanna sort of sum up in, in brief here, um, as I've gone on for a while, uh, the battlefield of memory, what all this means to the present uh, and, and why uh, and how it is being mobilized by Chinese leaders today. Uh, now, I, I, in exploring memory, I don't want to delight in just proving uh, that there are precedents to almost everything and the, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and I certainly don't want to reify proclamations about the century of national humiliation, um, fueling uh, sort of a revanchist and aggressive China today. Rather, it's my goal to look back onto this history because of the extent to which the People's Republic of China and CCP propaganda mobilizes the memory of these conflicts to legitimate ongoing naval modernization uh, in the 21st century. We should see it sort of as the second effort 120 years later to create a modern ocean going Navy. History in this sense is not just a guide. Uh, it's not just a mirror with which to, uh, uh, to, with which to understand the rise and fall of great powers as a Tang Dynasty emperor once put it, it's also a form of soft power used by the CCP to legitimate uh, military expenditures today. Uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, you can take uh, Chairman Xi Jinping uh, at his word for it. Uh, quote, history is the best medicine for a clear awakening. Don't forget national humiliation. It can serve all out strengthening. Only by remembering history can we pioneer uh, the future, uh, which sounds like job security to me. And uh, I'm grateful for this proclamation. Now, uh, those of you who've been to China will know that memorial, memorialization is something of a cottage industry uh, in the mainland. Um, we have uh, an example of that here uh, at the Dagu uh, Fort, uh, the memorial. And we've seen a couple of, of images uh, from this site earlier in the presentation. The breastworks themselves were constructed to defend uh, Tianjin and the approaches to Beijing. Uh, from amphibious assault and their key sites in both the Second Opium War and the Boxer Rebellion. But I think uh, it's, it's very possible that today their real significance is in uh, patriotic education, is in the undergirding of an effort to invest in a modern Chinese military. They exist to remind posterity, uh, quote, that those who lag behind will be bullied and only through strength, uh, uh, only through strength, strength and prosperity can there be security, that's loho chiliao aida, those who lag behind will be, will be bullied, will be struck. That's a passable slogan for any era, and I think it puts a pretty fine point on the use of history as a tool of contemporary mobilization. The Liu uh, Gongdao Memorial, or the Sakaino Japanese War Memorial, the Jiawu Zhangzheng uh, Boguan, uh, is engaged in an even more ambitious process, uh, I think, to link the past and the present. It's located in Weihaiwei Harbor, uh, and it's a naval headquarters of the Beiyang Fleet, the North Sea Fleet. Uh, but today, it's a memorial and a museum and actually a pretty lively scholarly journal about the meaning of the Sino-Japanese War. All right. Uh, the thesis, I think, that this uh, museum advances uh, is... So what do I sort of mean by this? Uh, I think... Uh, so the traditional understanding, Marxist understanding of this period, as I've said before, uh, is that the foreign affairs movement and the wars that punctuate it um, fail because they are overly invested in advanced technologies. And they, when they succeed or where they succeed, it is only because of the spirit and patriotic fervor of the Chinese people. Uh, at best, attempts to acquire foreign weapons or build them were quixotic and even wasteful. Uh, this makes good sense as a, a narrative uh, for a, a Maoist era committed to people's war in the conviction that millet and rifles can defeat even the most sophisticated of material allies. But it's, it's really sort of incongruous with Chinese uh, military modernization today. It's a hard line to take in an era of local wars under high tech conditions or informationized conditions. Museums and memorials like this one here at Liu Gongdao offer an alternative vision of the Chinese military past. Uh, touring uh, is, is exhibit shows how the naval theater of the Sino-Japanese War was, uh, in its time, a sort of local war under high-tech conditions. 
uh, that uh, PRC strategists have predicted and written about since the 1990s. So this institution has become a real battleground in the field of memory, and it's also become uh, a source of legitimacy for thinking about why and how China should invest uh, real capital into naval forces today. This is, this is all a bit literal, I think. Uh, this is a photo from an article in Xinhua that shows the museum quite literally excavating and rehabilitating uh, armor from the battleship Dingyuan that was sunk at the bottom of the harbor. Quite, quite literally dredging up the past in the service of the future. And, and it's not just a matter of museums, uh, I hasten to add, uh, which are sort of dry and dusty places. Chinese propaganda, Chinese movies and films are engaged in a similar effort to rehabilitate the Qing past uh, with an eye towards glamorizing it uh, and thinking about the present. Uh, consider this uh, 2013 uh, movie about the Battle of Zhenhai, the Zhenhai Defensive, uh, battle, which I think crystallizes some of these terms uh, quite neatly. Um, if you, summarizing the film in a few screenshots here, we find the Qing wrestling with the aftermath of defeat of their conventional naval forces at Fuzhou, uh, and really stressing about the safety of the port city of Ningbo uh, against the French, and realizing the imperative of defending the fortifications at Zhenhai. Who to do this, uh, you know, is a, a, a matter of concern even to the emperor, the Guangxu emperor himself, who settles on nominating the Qing functionary Shui Fuchang uh, because he's good at doing exactly what Wei Yuan asked uh, China to be good at, using the ways of the foreigners to control foreigners. And Shui Fuchang, seen uh, at the right here, is indeed quite good at that. Uh, he uses artillery, mines, obstructions to defeat the French, but here in the movie, he actually fires uh, automobile torpedoes, fish torpedoes at the French flagship and drives them out, showing mastery of advanced violence, uh, not advanced technologies and advanced violence. So not people's war, but in fact, uh, really sort of advanced high-tech war, limited war under high-tech uh, conditions. I think that's a pretty substantial departure from the Maoist line. This film is not alone. We see similar treatments uh, about the political conditions of Taiwan. You can't give up Taiwan. You can't give up the Liaodong Peninsula uh, in this fine film. Uh, and, and also uh, histories of the Sino-Japanese War uh, itself, rescuing it from defeat and displaying it as something uh, really grand and significant. Uh, the, that's, uh, that's something that's actually familiar uh, to me as a historian of US military policy. Uh, it's something the United States engages in in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt of the Great White Fleet fame originally wrote his undergraduate thesis at Harvard on the Naval War of 1812 and sort of rescues uh, from defeat a few scenes of victory that are used to legitimate investment uh, in an industrial navy in the United States. I think movies like this are making the same case. Even in defeat, you can find examples of heroism uh, and greatness that can be used uh, to argue uh, for contemporary naval investment. Okay, well, so what, right? What, what, what's all this about? Uh, what, what should we take away from the Qing in the late 19th century? I, I think four themes come through that are relevant to this conference today. The first is that great power competition and gray zone competition uh, are, are just not new to the Western Pacific. In fact, they're sort of baked into the industrial era. Much of that history is about gray hulled ships, about symmetrical competition with European and Japanese uh, forces. And attempts to mobilize that effort uh, give us uh, things uh, like this, the sort of public facing effort uh, of glamorizing Chinese naval investment. I snapped this picture of a, a sort of a Lego set of the Liaoning aircraft carrier outside the Beijing uh, National Library in 2016. On the fringes of imperial competition, we also have a complement to this, to gray, it's a gray hull conflict in the form of gray war. Interventions below the threshold of war, like the Japanese invasion of Taiwan in 1874, lawfare as well, and uh, the instance of the Kaohsiung controversy, uh, and also a conflict over the information space, as we see in presentations of Japanese violence in the Sino-Japanese War. A second theme is contingency. You can fill bookshelves uh, with fawning reports from the 1880s and 90s about the success of China's military modernization. But that, that, that effort, those military strides that are achieved on paper come to grief when confronted with the French and Japanese military. 
I think it's important for us to have a similar humility about the scale and the scope of China's military modernization uh, today. This is all very contingent and it's difficult to know how it will fare in practical terms. Third, uh, it's remarkable how often Americans pop up in the story of China's uh, Navy in the late Qing period. There are Americans in China serving as torpedo effort experts, uh, naval instructors, and even a would-be uh, Chinese admiral, admiral of the Chinese Navy. Here are two continental powers on either side of the Pacific, and it's worth remembering in this moment of, of tension, of competition, that as often as not, China and the United States are engaged in sympathetic projects. Uh, that's true of World War II, obviously, but in this case, in the 1880s and the 1890s, it's, it's true as well as Americans think about how to modernize the Chinese Navy, or at least sympathetic to the modernization of the Chinese Navy as a way of checking uh, competing empires like Britain or France, carving out zones of exclusive influence along the littorals. Finally, uh, in shaking off the much maligned Qing, I, I want to show how memory is a tool of the present. It's very much alive today. This is not something that is old, uh, an, an old and happy and far off thing, but rather it's also fodder uh, for the present. Um, what was the past about anyways? What lessons do we take from it? How and why were the wars of the 19th century fought and what do they tell us about the fault lines today? All these are historically sensitive topics and politically sensitive topics and they're key, key phases and the information battle uh, ongoing uh, today in the Western Pacific about territorial, uh, about territorial uh, disputes and also about sort of the, the, the hierarchy of power in the Western Pacific. Uh, one thing uh, I think is for certain, uh, the waves around Eurasia are increasingly crowded um, and uh, the competition therein is in many ways reminiscent of the 19th century. So it makes me feel very familiar at, at home. In this context, the last great attempt by a continental power to become a sea power looms large um, as a set of precedents, as a conflict that shaped the geopolitics of the region, uh, and perhaps most meaningfully, I think, as a memory uh, that is legitimizing uh, Chinese military expansion today. So thank, thanks very much for your time and thanks for the opportunity to, to sort out some of my own thoughts here. Uh, I look forward to your questions very much. All right, great. Uh, thank you so much, Tommy. That was a great presentation. Uh, boy, it's it's a lot to digest, and we, we've got some great uh, questions and comments from the audience. You know, I I, I failed to mention uh, at the beginning of before Tommy um, got up and got started. You know, I just wanted to emphasize to the audience that uh, there are so many aspects to this topic that we're hitting on this week. Uh, and we're trying to provide as much uh, breadth and depth uh, to the subject as we can. And for sure, uh, as Americans anyway, uh, definitely we don't, we don't always do a, a good job of uh, learning our lessons from history, which, which kind of leads me into my first question. Uh, and it's, it's a synthesis of some of what's coming out of the, uh, the audience's questions as well. But you know, the, this story that you've told us um, on gray hole competition, there are so many lessons interwoven into this history on, on gray zone, asymmetric, irregular conflict through, throughout that. You know, uh, so the, I guess the question is how aware, how aware or informed by this history do you think uh, China is today as they consider, you know, below, below conventional, you know, sub, sub conflict, gray zone conflict, how informed by this history are they? It, as Americans, we're awful at it. Uh, we were absolutely terrible at learning our lessons from history, but, you know, uh, the Chinese tend to take a much longer view of things than we do. So, you know, is this, are these things that you've talked about today, this history, are, is that informing them well, uh, do you think? Uh, you know, it's, it's a, an important contrast, uh, Lumpy, uh, between Chinese perceptions of history and American perceptions of history. I remember uh, I was having lunch one day outside the National Library of, of China, and uh, one of the servers asked me, uh, you know, what, what are you there studying? What are, what are your interests? And I said, oh, I'm sort of, I'm, U I'm interested in U.S. history. And they looked, looked at me and, and deadpan. The U.S. is too young. It doesn't have any history. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, 
it's 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 very i don't want to suggest that people should or do read from the past direct analogies to apply to the present um that, that's that's sort of a, a a risky thing to do particularly because particularly as the present becomes more attenuated than the past in terms of political conditions technological conditions and the like. I, th I think the way that this is operating most significantly, the memory of these conflicts is operating most significantly, is not at the tactical or operational levels of war, but at the strategic and political, um, in terms of what sorts of investments are made in China today. Uh, and those that challenge, how do you spend a finite amount of resources, is very much shaped by the same constraints that were posed upon the Qing, right? The Qing is constantly torn between the issue of frontier defense. You know, should you be out in Central Asia uh, competing with Mongols uh, and, and Central uh, Asian Muslim powers in Russia, uh, or should you be focused on protecting the littorals of China? And if you chose to protect the littorals, should you invest in defending your really extensive coastline that's cut up by rivers, uh, with asymmetric defenses, with early iterations of anti-access area denial technologies, or should you invest in like a, a major great power ocean going Navy? And I think, um, well, well, I don't have any uh, definitive proof of this. Some of the, in, the decisions made about investments uh, in particular technologies and anti-access area denial technologies are being driven by the same sorts of resource constraints and geostrategic constraints that drove the Qing to be interested in things like the torpedo, right? Like the ship carrier, carrier missiles and so forth uh, are animated by the same sorts of uh, calculations that make Li Hongzhong invest very heavily in torpedo defenses. So I, I'd say it's operating there. That's where it's really sort of shaping what's happening in China today. It's at this, this level of what do we invest in and why? Uh, because while technology is changing rapidly, the geostrategics of East Asia, the Western Pacific remain largely the same. Okay. Uh, one, one thing, a topic you hit on uh, news to me is, is how far back the early attempts to mobilize the courts uh, systems uh, go back in Chinese history. It's very interesting. And as you noted, uh, we see that today across the board, South China Sea, uh, India, the UN, Uyghurs. Um, you know, what, what are we missing? Um, what are we when I say we, I, I'd say, you know, Western democracies, uh, what are we missing in this equation? Um, you know, as China is obviously informed by history as they, as they continue to try and influence courts around the world, uh, where can we take some initiative here? Uh, uh, that's a great question, Lumpy. I might have to punt on it. Um, it it's, it's true um, that this has a, a long history. It, it goes back even further than that to the Opium Wars, uh, when Lin Zixu writes a, a famous letter to Queen Victoria, appealing uh, to the values of the British people to essentially stop importing drugs uh, into southern China. So this is, this is really baked into the history of maritime defense and great power competition, literally from its inception in, in the Opium War era. I, I don't have a good answer to that question of how the United States should seize the initiative on it. I, I think the, the answer um, that I'll provide is that these remarkable institutions that come out of World War II, um, the system of international law, the United Nations and so forth, are, uh, are easily appropriated by other states and just because they were established by the United States doesn't necessarily mean that they're used towards the U.S. ends. Um, and this is a familiar theme, and I think lawfare, um, lawfare is a species of that general genus. And in, in this case, I'm sort of comfortable only in saying that we should be cognizant of how far back in terms of precedent it goes in the history of great power competition in the Western Pacific. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, next question, you know, and I, I'm trying to I'm trying, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying to draw out a lot of them are um, there. There uh, it's quite a spectrum of questions. I'm trying to draw out some of the ones that focus a little bit more on uh, the gray zone, if you will. 
So you had mentioned, you know, there were even, you know, examples from the Sino-French War, examples where uh, fleets failed, but perhaps successful people's wars, um, you know, did not fail. Uh, so there's there's an asymmetric uh, aspect to those engagements. So as far as as far as gray zone or regular warfare goes, you know the 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 emphasis is on um, influence influencing populations, legitimacy, uh, perceptions of legitimacy. As you as you talk about these naval developments, failures, and successes, do you have any examples, or can you give us any examples of influencing? populations to affect legitimacy, you know, in addition to what's happening uh, with the gray hulls themselves? Uh, let me, can I, can I add, do you mean within uh, the Chinese domestic context? Or? Either, so so that's that's an interesting point. Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I was yeah, deliberately- An important contrast with, with a, like a democratic society, which really needs to mobilize popular support to secure a finite amount of public funding, right? Not necessarily right. something yeah, so so it's it's a great question, right? This is where it gets really complex, and this is where I, I I love to dig into this concept. Where, you know, as we look at this problem of influencing populations and uh, affecting legitimacy, uh, both sides of the conflict are on the receiving end and the giving end of of those things that are happening. You know, those things. So I ask you, from either from either perspective or any perspective. Uh, up to you. Do you have any? Yeah. So, I, in some ways, this is a this is a story of potentially uh, what I find so interesting about the aggressive effort to mobilize history, the history of late imperial China, as a tool of legitimation today uh, in terms of naval investment, is a story of how fragile the political consensus inside of China might be today. It's an authoritarian regime that is nonetheless working to build uh, popular knowledge about these events. What does that tell us? Well, it, it tells us that perhaps uh, this is sort of superficial, that investment in advanced uh, naval technologies and ocean-going fleets, sort of a navalist conception of sea power, might be, might be brittle. Um, and it's difficult to know how deep it runs. Um, but what we, can, what we can say for sure is that there is a, a very concerted effort to cultivate this and then present it uh, in front, you know, by state media, uh, in terms of museums, in terms of movies and the like, in front of uh, the, the, the People's Republic of Popu China population. Um, why, why do that uh, if it is a natural thing for China to build a large ocean-going navy, right? This is, this is a sort of a, a difficult thing to convince people who are a giant continental power to do. Um, and I, I take some sort of reassurance from that, that this is, this is a difficult thing to do. It's something that China's having to work at very hard, uh, and it may not be sustainable in the long run. Um, and it, it, we'll, we'll see how uh, powerful something uh, like history could be as a, as a source uh, of, of, of undergirding uh, these sorts of investments. Okay. Uh, one theme that you hit on, and several of our speakers earlier in the week did as well, uh, you know, it may not have been um, overt or deliberate or, you know, uh, publicized as much it was the the idea of assessing and studying the foreign yeah. savages you know to develop grand strategy if you will it probably wasn't called grand strategy but you know that that was the idea and um i think many would argue today that we are lacking a grand strategy uh <laughs> it, it's it's kind of easy to make that argument i think so you know along those lines um it leads me into this question from one of our audience members. How does U.S. optimism over Chinese naval capabilities, uh, so this gets back to the assessment piece, right? How does U.S. optimism over Chinese naval capabilities affect the, dyna the, the dynamic that we see today? Yeah, I, I think that likely what we're seeing is, a, if, if history is any guide, which it often is, um, you, you would say that the difference, the gap between what the Chinese Navy was doing 
in the 1990s, what the People's Liberation Army Navy was capable of doing in, of the 1990s, even like the early aughts uh, relative to today is, is so astounding, it's so fast um, that it's colored our perceptions of it. Um, that change, uh, the, the, the sort of the qualitative difference, not just quantitative difference between those two forces uh, has colored our perceptions of its inherent capabilities, um, which are untried uh, and unproven. And that's the, the trap that people in the 19th century fall into and credulously assume that China is basically going to wipe the floor with uh, Japan in an engagement. There's, there's very little sense that the small island nation of Japan is going to be able to defeat a country that is 10 times larger than it uh, and has a naval power that in terms of tonnage is two or three times larger than it. I, I do wonder uh, if today intelligence assessments are not falling in, falling into some sort of a, a similar trap. Um, this is not a, a full-fledged thought on my part, but I think we should be sensitive to that, to that possibility. Uh, and that uh, pure numerical tonnage, um, quali uh, capabilities on paper do not necessarily signal uh, naval capabilities, actualizable naval power uh, as, as, as becomes you know, of paramount importance. Uh, in the in actual engagements with French or uh, Japanese naval forces. So you know, are we are we you know what, what's the cost of overestimating these things, and how how does one avoid doing it? Uh, you should, we should be sensitive to that possibility. Um, right here's another good one from from the audience. To what to what extent do these hid, historic narratives that we project onto Chinese history from the outside looking in? Mm. Uh, actually animate, motivate, or you know, I guess you even shape demographics within China, whether you're talking about the political military elite versus the proletariat. Um, <laughs> yeah, what a, great, what a great question. That's sort of a very grad school uh, history question. You know, how does, how, how, do, how, do, how does U.S. history, which sort of has the pride of place um, in the historical profession today, shape the way other countries view their own history. I think that's probably partic particularly true, right? Because of how many members of uh, the CCP elite sort of, um, you know, what, what's the Guanar Dai, second generation officials, uh, members of uh, the children of the Chinese elite study abroad at places like US UCLA and Harvard, right? Um, that was the joke when I was teaching modern Chinese history is, uh, well, maybe not a joke is, you know, sort of what does what your file look like inside the CCP uh, as you sort of present the history of modern China? You know, who, who's reporting back on you? Um, for years, for a long time, the accepted interpretation of modern Chinese history comes out of what is done uh, by, by essentially by U.S. historians up until the 60s and 70s, uh, or excuse me, the 50s and 60s, when Marxist historians provide their own take on it. And that's sort of the dominant trait and uh, sort of dominant uh, narrative inside China until opening up and reform in the 1890s. Uh, when people start going abroad and are, are become much more sensitive to understanding uh, uh, understanding Western techniques as a way of stimulating the the economy uh, and reforming society, and it's it's pretty profound how much uh, U.S. historical conventions shape the historical narrative of China, particularly the impact response idea, the idea that the opium wars shake China out of a stupor, uh, and then China is in a race to catch up after that. I mean, that that's basically the logic of the century of national humiliation that's exposed by uh, Xi Jinping today. And if you were to go to a history seminar at Tsinghua University uh, or Be Beijing University today, you'd find people who are problematizing that and critiquing it, right? But I think the dominant historical, the dominant popular consensus, this idea of the century of national humiliation is, is very much one that is shaped uh, by, by outside historical scholarship. And so in some ways that's a curious form of soft power that's wielded by the United States uh, over foreign countries, right? The elite U.S. academy that trains so many historians, that trains so many scholars, that trains so many government officials um, is, is, a, is a form of real considerable might. And I think perhaps we take it for granted too often. Uh, we, should, we should really cherish that. Okay. Um, here's a good one. Uh, in your presentation, uh, your character, and you may not agree with this, in your presentation, your character is characterization of gray zone are soft that soft activities occurring simultaneously or in some cases even afterwards 
uh, after naval battles. The prevailing characterization of gray zone today is beneath the level of armed conflict and intending to gain advantage before or in lieu of armed conflict. It seems to me that there's a stretch to draw clear linkages from the late 19th century to today. Uh, would you care to comment on this? Yes, it's a stretch of uh, over a hundred years. It's a, it's difficult, you know. It's it's difficult, and we should be sensitive about it, right? So, you know, this this is a this is a problematic thing to do. Uh, uh, drawing uh, direct historical analogies is something I do not encourage uh, people to do. I, what what I what I just sort of hope to do in this presentation is to think about um, the history of modern China on the timeline that is operative in China itself. To think about this full sweep of 150 years or so. Uh, and then I, I take this criticism of, of gray, gray zone operations being not necessarily what I'm describing, uh, being a, a something that happens before war, before overt hostilities are declared uh, or beneath the, the threshold of, of overt armed conflict. Um, I hope what people will take away from this, this presentation uh, is that the, the Qing are sort of involved in lots of things that are, are gray, gray, zone, gray zone adjacent perhaps uh, in the late 19th century. Um, and, and that these have a long history uh, in the Western Pacific. I, I think that's a fair criticism. Okay. Um, how effective will Xi's reliance on the century of humiliation as a booster of national unity and motivation be if he continues to rewrite history to portray that period as one of Chinese triumph? Yeah, so this is uh, what Mao Zedong would call a, an internal contradiction, uh, or, or, you know, a cross post Karl Marx, right? And in terms of soft power, it's worth uh, focusing on these sorts of things and exploiting them. So that's that's a potential area for exploitation, I think, right. um, in terms of the information environment. Um, you, you, this is all sort of caveated in the way it's presented, right? Like the presentation uh, of these events is that there, there are some examples of success that you can pull out, uh, but I, I'm not sure uh, that the overwhelming narrative of failure is going anywhere, but I, I, I'm attracted to that, that insight uh, that this is a potential opportunity to stress uh, the extent to which um, national humiliation actually contained with it uh, seeds of considerable power uh, and, and resistance. Uh, China never becomes uh, a colony uh, in the way that uh, much of Africa or, or India does. It's uh, in a, a phase of semi-colonialism. It retains considerable autonomy. Uh, these are all things that are worth uh, pointing out uh, as, as, as a means of critiquing, um, critiquing the, the Chinese Communist Party's presentation of history, uh, which is, to my mind, a key, a real key battleground of the information space, because so many of the topics that we discussed today are fundamentally bound up in history. Like how, how does China get its borders in inner, in, in, in inner Asia? Uh, is this a story of imperial conquest? Should, it, should China, which is an avowedly anti-imperial nation, be considered an empire in the 18th and 19th century that acquired its borders through imperial uh, annexations? Um, all these are, are sensitive questions, um, and I think it's worth uh, exploiting them in, in information operations and propaganda as a way of making uh, the Chinese official of them sort of accurately confront their history. I think that's that's not that's not below the belt. Uh, it's not uh, not cricket. Uh, it's uh, uh, sort of a fair and honest accounting of what it means uh, to confront uh, one's history and how uh, China came to its current position uh, in East Asia today. Okay, uh, you, you kind of hit on this one already uh, just now and earlier, but I'll, I'll put it out there just to see if this triggers any other thoughts. Um, does the history presented by Dr. Jameson today in a way shape Chinese strategic culture? Or uh, perhaps is strategic culture still a relevant dimension uh, in, is in understanding or other, in, in understanding China or other states for that matter? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this issue, uh, so strategic culture is, um, uh, it's, it's a, a tricky, a sticky wicket uh, in terms of, of China. Um, it's often uh, discussed quite vulgarly, vulg vulgarly in the West uh, as something that comes sort of in an un, an un uh, uh, diluted line from uh, Sunza and his art of war uh, down to the present. Um, but it's also clear, right, uh, that 
culture, strategic culture, that the context of China, Chinese culture, uh, is likely playing some sort of uh, role in the making of grand strategy in China today. Uh, the, the sort of the best book on this is by Patrick Porter. Uh, on it's called Military Orientalism, uh, and it describes how uh, foreign perceptions of uh, East Asia uh, uh, distort understandings of, uh, of strategic culture, uh, particularly in China. And I would encourage uh, uh, the person who asked that question to consider picking up a, a copy of that book because it's really quite uh, e exceptional and explaining this in ways that I won't be able to. But yes, yeah, I do. I, you know, I think the, the history is uh, inseparable from the making of strategy. Uh, and it's clear that it plays a role, but we shouldn't overestimate that um, because I think in some ways uh, it can often become uh, quite quite uh, cartoonish and can blind us to some of the complexities that are operating in China today. Okay. Um, do you have a read on the difference between China's use of memory in its in information operations internally versus externally? Uh, that, that would be uh, a, t a topic of it. That's another kettle of fish. Um, it matters a great deal particularly to issues like Taiwan uh, and the, inter the intercontinental front, the, the inner continent, continental frontier, Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet. Um, and I, I think obviously, you know, sort of concerns over the South China Sea and so forth. That's, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and one I'd have to think about uh, uh, in, in, in more depth. This, this presentation is sort of focused on how, on, an, on, on how history is mobilized for a domestic audience. Right. But of, of course, this is outward facing as well. And we see a great deal of this, uh, I think, most prominently in the proliferation of these Confucian networks uh, of uh, institutions around the world that present sort of a sanitized vision of Chinese uh, history um, that is sort of neatly packaged and, and digestible and very attractive. So that's certainly happening. How uh, the the history of the late Qing is being used to uh, ameliorate disputes over contested boundaries um, is, is something that's uh, more complicated than I really feel like I have the expertise uh, to answer here, uh, but it's a wonderful question for further resource. So thank you to the, to the respondent. Okay, uh, one of the audience members asked if you could uh, say the name of the book again that you just mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago. That's Sorry, that's Military or Orientalism, Military Orientalism. All right. Um, aside from the gray hulls of the Navy, what role do you see the white hulls of the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard's deployable specialized force? Uh, specific? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question for sure. Um, also a long, long history in the, the Qing. The Qing has a Navy in the 18th century. It's fairly capable and it's engaged uh, in, in counter piracy work. Uh, Taiwan is one of the great nests of pirates of the early modern world and even of the early uh, 19th century. And the coasting uh, forces of, of the Qing are, are, exist primarily to control uh, those maritime regular warfighters. Uh, war um, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it's new-ish, um, but it's legitimated in Chinese propaganda. Uh, in, in both the films I referenced, the history of the Zhenhai battle and uh, the Sino-Japanese War movie, we see examples of commanders trusting uh, roles of considerable importance to local fishermen uh, who then go out and engage in major and sort of irregular ways and reconnaissance efforts uh, and sabotage efforts against foreign forces. So I think uh, it, it's curious to see this sort of popping up in the propaganda about this period, about something that has a long history in the Qing. Uh, the actual historical record on this is a little more nebulous, um, but that doesn't that that has never stood in the way of a, a good story by propagandists who are eager to sort of leverage this uh, towards a way of legitimizing a, a, an, an invented history, an invented tradition, perhaps, of Chinese or doing maritime warfare uh, at sea. So I, I think basically the answer is um, that the Coast Guard has a history in the Qing, and it's one that um, we see being sort of propped up uh, through popular commemoration. Uh, and and that's a, it's a great note as well. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll, I've got a few more uh, audience questions and then I'll, I'll close it out with a couple uh, questions and thoughts that I've got on my own. Um, do you see any scenario, you know, today where the U.S. and China may form a more 
amicable alliance? Uh, perhaps is it a common threat or no? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, uh, what one would, um, what one hopes so. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, what, you know, it's, it certainly sounds preferable to fighting another Cold War, uh, which I, I think is sort of a dismal prospect, very depressing uh, prospect. Um, uh, but I, I, I am I, I am sort of uh, of of the the school of thoughts that's extremely pessimistic about the coming uh, period of relatively intense security operate, uh, competition uh, between the United States and China, particularly as long as the United States remains anchored in the Western Pacific uh, with. Uh, its alliance to Japan, right? This is a security dilemma that antedates uh, U.S. efforts to uh, project power into the Pacific in any meaningful way. It's a geostrategic uh, conundrum for Beijing and Tokyo. Uh, it was there before, it's going to be there uh, after the United States. And I think as long as the United States is on the outside of the alliance, it becomes more difficult. Now, one could imagine the sort of a, 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 some kind of a machinerist uh, world uh, in, in which a great power assume a great power other than China um, gains predominant gains primacy in Eurasia, and then Beijing seeks help from the United States as a means of balancing against that uh, power. And, you know, this is what brings Nixon to China in 1972, and it's not so far fetched to think that something similar could happen uh, today. Um, it all sort of depends on trajectories and, and trend lines. Um, but as I pointed out in this uh, presentation several times, those, those are fundamentally contingent. It's very difficult to predict the future. Um, my, let's see if I have it here, my, my copy of The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, right, which is like the, the, most, the most cited and, and I think least read book uh, these days uh, in military staff colleges around uh, the world. Uh, is, is actually from 1987, and it has, um, you'll see uh, England stepping off, or England off the uh, sort of the podium, Uncle Sam slinking away, and Japan rising, which of course does, doesn't happen, right? So uh, who knows, it could be that in 20 years, uh, another uh, smart aleck like me is looking back uh, with a copy of Graham Allison's Thucydides Trap uh, to illustrate a, a similar point, and I, I sort of hope that's the case. Okay, all right. Um an admin note for the audience out there, we are aware that uh, ZoomGov, which is the platform we are running on, there are some issues. We've informed them. They, they're they aware of it. Uh, and we know that there's some people who are not able to get into the room. Uh, we're doing our best and we're working on that. So just please be aware that uh, we're, we're tracking that problem. There's not a whole lot we can do. Uh, we are, <laughs> we're subject to the, the platform uh, that gets run as well. We, we don't have too much control over that, but we're working on the problem. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Tommy, uh, I've got one more question and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave it over to you for any closing thoughts uh, in addition to that. But, you know, trying to bring this, this, his, this historical discussion that we've had uh, back more succinctly focused on gray zone, as, uh, asymmetric, hybrid conflict, irregular warfare, you know, in the realm of uh, below the threshold of war, uh, do you have any recommendations or, you know, you've provided a few areas, some fissures that we might be able to exploit uh, in the information domain, but given everything that we've talked about here today, that's uh, looking back, looking at today and a little bit looking ahead, Looking ahead some more, do you have any other thoughts, recommendations? If you could, if you could talk to policymakers, whether it's U.S. or otherwise uh, today, what what would your recommendations be in some areas below uh, conventional uh, conflict where we might be able to take advantage of some of the things that you've you've uh, educated us about here today? <laughs> Unfortunately, as an assistant professor, this is well beyond my, my pay grade. I feel like I, I should get another 10 years to develop. These <laughs> That's sorts okay. Of grand, grand uh, there's no wrong but, answer. There's no but, wrong yeah. answer. So take your best stab at it. Right, right, right. So I, you know, I, I think you, you, the way to, if, if uh, we are seeing a major revision of the international system led by Beijing, uh, the, the goal basically should be to impose upon it 
uh, imposed upon the CCP the same sort of constraints and challenges that the Qing faced. Um, a, a real tension between the interior frontier, uh, a demand for resources to police its interior frontier, a worry about internal revolution, internal stability of the regime, uh, and then the pressure of, uh, of maritime penetration, of worry about worry about the security of, of the maritime frontier, which is very difficult to police because it is so uh, vast, uh, you know, even greater uh, than that of the, of the United States because it's all concentrated on one end of China. And those sorts of trade-offs are, are very difficult for any one polity to, uh, to uh, address. And I think in, imposing those dilemmas on Beijing is, is probably the best means below the threshold of overt confrontation of limiting uh, Chinese expansionism uh, to to the region, um, I, I, I will say that in, in, in terms of internal stability, uh, in terms of information operations that might uh, be exploitable, this this question of okay, what's what's the deal with how China gets its borders? Uh, what's the deal with how China uh, and the Qing uh, come to power in, in Asia? Uh, is an extremely sensitive political topic. Uh, and it's one that, uh, as members of a free and open society, we shouldn't hesitate to talk about. Uh, this is one of one of the advantages, inherent advantages, that a democracy has in a confrontation with an authoritarian regime. Um, and I think sort of poking poking that sore spot uh, early and often is is an excellent way of uh, ex of sort of exposing fissures within uh, the Chinese political project. 